kick off. We are underway. It's all yours. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Digital Rebar Online Meetup number eight, the first of 2018. No, we did not coordinate eight and 18. It's not fully coordinated, but there's an eight at the end of each one of those. In any case, uh, happy new year to everybody. We've got the full uh, Digital Rebar crew on board. We've got Rob, we've got Greg, we've got Victor, we've got Steven, and in addition to that, we've got uh, Isaac, what do we call you? Uh, uh, Digital Rebar Light or uh, uh, Rob Jr.? <laughs> We've uh, got, in any case, go ahead. Light is pretty cool. Sorry. Light is pretty cool. <laughs> well, he goes by Meshia uh, online. <laughs> so welcome, Isaac. Uh, we appreciate uh, your input for today. We'll be talking a little bit more about UI stuff and UX changes over the holiday break with Isaac. And we've got Chris Trees, also known as Cat, on the community channel. Uh, welcome. Uh, did I miss anybody there? I don't think I did. Uh, today we have for agenda, we're going to talk a little bit about release planning and status. We've got some enhanced logging features and capabilities, uh, which Victor was feverishly coding up over the holiday uh, season. Instead of having cheer, he was uh, building cheer for the rest of us that consume digital rebar. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the UI UX tweaks uh, and some future changes that are planned, uh, both uh, Rob uh, at Zeehicle and Isaac at Meshius have uh, both been hacking away at uh, over the holiday season as well. And last and least, uh, seems to always end up being least since we seem to run out of time, but we'll try and squeeze in a few minutes for community feedback at the end. Uh, in the meantime, uh, welcome everyone. Did everybody have a good holiday season? Yes. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Fabulous. Uh, Victor, you want to kick off with a little bit of, on your feverish uh, enhanced logging, hacking capabilities, etc. over the, the season? There's some pretty exciting stuff that I saw flying by in the uh, uh, Git check-ins and uh, whatnot. You want to tell us just a little bit about the impetus behind the changes there, and we'll go into a little more details after that. Sure. Well, the um, short version is that uh, um, I've threaded the logs through so that they now log all messages on what is more, what is pretty much a per request basis. Um, each uh, log entry has gained an identifier that uh, indicates um, which request it's up. Uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, it was admitted as part of, and there's also an overall global sequence number that you can use to reconstruct the uh, order of events that uh, things happened at in the system. And I've also changed the uh, log levels from uh, numerical log levels to the more standard, uh, you know, trace, debug, info, warn, error, and so on. Okay, fabulous. So it sounds like in summary, uh, we're going to have the ability to be able to uh, walk back through a, a log trace and be able to pull out uh, individual streams of logs that relate to a given provisioning activity. Does that sound? Um, a given um, API or DHCP or static file request. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So we'll be able to pull out interesting log data at uh, different levels based on uh, important events that trigger those log events that we can trace through the system and through the, the life cycle of the um, event itself through the system. Um, so what yeah. are some of the... Also, uh, uh, I've also added the ability to uh, be able to, you know, we, we, you can continue to set the log levels via the UX or the uh, API globally, but I've also added the ability to uh, allow you to uh, change the log level or change the uh, level that uh, logs will be logged at uh, on a per request basis. So for instance, if we wanted to uh, do troubleshooting, we could set, we could uh, set a flag in the CLI that says uh, trace all or log everything that happens with these at the trace or the debug level. And then all the logs that we have in the backend for debug or trace will be emitted instead of uh, whatever the global defaults are. 
Okay, awesome. So, and I believe if I remember correctly, that's um, can be done on the fly where you can just say toggle on off on the fly. So we can just dynamically enable or disable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the way it works is you can either set them via preferences or you can set them on a per API request basis. So you could, you could literally be troubleshooting one, one set of requests at different logging levels in the system. Yep. And the, other, the other thing we were planning to do with the UX is to have it automatically pass in the user ID of the, of the caller in, in all of the API and the UX generator requests so that you would be able to differentiate who made what calls from the UX and UX calls in general uh, against an endpoint. Yeah. And, then, and then the UX, we're, we're talking about adding a screen to the UX to get to subscribe to these events, logging events, so that you would be able to get your log history out of the system in the UX without having to go to the, the endpoint at all. Yes. Um, Logs also, now every log entry that gets created uh, by DR provision will emit a corresponding event. And those can be, you know, tracked by anything that can listen to events. And the most recent set of uh, logs, or the most recent uh, lines are also buffered in memory. So uh, I haven't exposed that to the API yet, but it would be pretty easy to add an API that just says grab the last thousand log, or log entries. So what's the reason for analysis. buffering in memory? Uh, because uh, outside of doing that, the logs can go to any number of different places. They can go to syslog. They could be printed out on standard out or standard error if, if you're running under. Um, and we don't have any control over that. But what we do have control over is how, how much uh, essentially context we want to keep around for troubleshooting purposes. Okay. And that's what the buffer so, is for. And so the. Um, would that be a plugin change then? We'd add a plugin to say do logging to Splunk, do logging to an elk stack, do logging to custom webhook API of customer XYZ. Ah. Okay, that's that's a different thing. Um, and that's something that's enabled by the fact that all logged uh, that uh, every that we emitted event for every log that contains everything that was in the log. And so for wiring into uh, Splunk or other third party uh, Logging tools that would be a plugin that would uh, essentially wire into those that would the cap that would listen for those events and uh, forward them or transform them as, as appropriate for whatever third party logging system. Okay, excellent. Uh, what else you want to tell us about this? Um, we got a little bit about futures and uh, Rob's desire to get the user ID passed in so we can do tracing and audit logging of user ID events and also determine um, who has triggered what events to help troubleshoot and debug what's happening in the system. Um, sorry, sorry, Greg, Greg and I were clarifying what user ID meant. Yeah, sorry, there was a clarification on the UX side. The, the DRP knows who the user is because it comes into the auth token. So that's already tracked. To be Correct. Available. This would be like SAS token ID and other stuff like that. Where it could be injected as part of the arbitrary token that gets passed in regard to the logging system. SAS is just that you your SAS user ID. Right, right. Anyway. Uh, Okay, great. Anything else on the logging? Um, there's probably more to come, but uh, right now we've got a pull request out there that I invite people to take a look at and we'll probably um, you know, go through fixing any that are founded and then, uh, get, to, and then uh, get it merged in in its current state before we do anything else. Okay. And where do we think this is going to land in terms of release to customers uh, when it's going to hit tip to begin with and then a, a versioned release? Um, yeah, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Greg. Uh, no, um, I was looking over it. I am reasonably happy with it kind of right now as a starting point. 
Um, there is a UI change that I will need to make, or somebody will need to make, but most likely me, uh, so that uh, the UX can handle both old and new logging levels based upon which DRP it's talking to. Um, so when that hits, then uh, we can probably pull it. My hope is to include it here in the next release, in the next day or two, uh, as just a baseline. Uh, but we can talk about that, I think, as we get to release bug content planning thing. So hopefully by the end of the week, we should see it uh, hit tip, uh, and then maybe we'll cut a stable by the end of the week. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, per our cadence, it would be sometime today or tomorrow. But we can. Yeah, we're a little a little behind on releases because, you know, we took some time off for holiday cheer and whatnot, except for Victor, who was just mad, crazy coding. And I don't know, Isaac and Rob, yeah. you were both pretty busy too. Yeah, but we don't, we're, not, we're not on the release cycle. <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, cadence on a regular cadence, not necessarily cycle. Yeah. So there's another. Well, change. I had to have something um, to do while watching the kids. So. Pull in. So, <laughs> uh, but we'll talk about that here in a bit. All right. Um, let's jump over to UI tweaks. Rob, you want to um, tee off um, some of the um, just an outline of some of the things that happened. And Isaac, we're hoping to get your feedback on some of the changes that you've made over the last uh, week and a half or so, um, some of the major uh, bugs you've squashed and any changes or enhancements you have made or any futures as well. So Rob, you wanna kick that off for us, please? Yeah, so um, one, of, one of our goals uh, was just to, to burn down some of the lingering defects that were in the system, um, like, not, like panels not closing correctly and stuff like that. Um, and Greg's, Greg's looking at the other feature that we have in queue uh, that hasn't been pulled in yet. Um, the, uh, one of the things that was this high on my list to enable was to actually be able to give version feedback about content, not just the endpoint version, because we have uh, people who, who are using content and the content can get stale and then that gets confusing. So there's a change coming on the info and preferences page that will uh, compare versions of installed content versus our, our references, and then um, and that and that will give you their direct feedback if, if there's upgrades available without having to go to each content page. So that'll be centralized. Um, probably needs a little bit more styling, maybe. Okay. Um, but for basics, it's actually it's pretty good. Um, and then. Uh, also, and then things that, we, that we're planning to do but haven't done is clean up the content, um, the way the content catalog works a little bit. So that'll come in. Um, and then Isaac, uh, I'll let him speak for himself, but one of the big ones was uh, session, session information, the way they're handling session tokens. So Isaac, you want to kick off and, and let us know what you were working on? Yeah. Um... So far, most of the stuff I've been doing is just quality of life enhancements. So, uh, like the the hanging pages where like template clones would hang. Uh, apparently, you couldn't see the version before. No one really noticed on uh, content pages. Uh, stuff like the save button on the system preferences. I moved up, so that'd be easier to see. Minor things like that. Auto renewing tokens. I believe I have completed. And a lot of this is soft coded configuration. So you can change that inside of just a single file. And we can effectively say, oh, we want our software to auto renew tokens every four hours instead of eight hours. That's not exposed to the user. Yeah. This is all. So, so one of the um, feedbacks we've gotten already, uh, which we need to look at for a future fix, is I think. Um, maybe with a move of the save bug, the save feature itself has broken. Did it? It did indeed. Um, I noted it and I think we had in community, it's either Chris or Will Dennis, I forget which, I have to go look at the chat. Um, clicking on save and the info props 
page doesn't seem to work. Huh. So we'll want to take a look at that. Um, but I did note the layout, it's a lot more cleaner. I like the way it's laid out now. I need to get that down then. <laughs> we'll, um, we'll drop an issue in line for that for you to take a look at. Um, Unfortunately, well, there was a comment in the, in the back channel, I think, from Chris. Uh, Cucumber and Selenium aren't necessarily suitable for um, React apps for doing, doing UX testing on them um, because of the way the, the page loads. It's, it's a lot harder to click testing because uh, the pages are dynamically rendered. So I'm, we're happy. We're happy for the suggestions. It's, it's you just have to keep in mind that that, that the UX is React, and it, it's basically a single page app. It is a single page app. It's not, there's no basically about it. All right. Um, do we have any UX, uh, UI testing tools that we know of off the top of our head without going too deep down that rabbit hole that might be appropriate? I... Um, that's, that's a really weird problem. <laughs> um, okay. Because either we, we write software that can just click on a bunch of stuff, which isn't too difficult, but maintaining that is yeah, every, a challenge every time a page itself. changes. Yeah. Every single time someone makes a new UI change, we have to either restructure like some of our testing. I, I, I think Chris, Chris is saying in the back channel that he thinks Selenium does it, and I think he's right. So it's a matter of looking into Selenium. Well, we have our new UX uh, engineer on board already then, our community UX engineer, <laughs> our tester. All right. Thanks, thanks Chris. I appreciate the... Uh... <laughs> No, definitely. We're, we look forward to, to kicking off getting some UX testing and we'll get some more feedback and structure around that going forward. Um, what else in the, the UI or UX? Is there anything else we wanted to sort of discuss in terms of features, capabilities? Rob, you wanted to talk a little bit about future. You wanted to talk about an offline mode and then I have an et cetera, dot, 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 dot. Yeah, for I'll, you to fill I'll, in. So we're, we're working, this will be a commercial offering from Rack End, but having a uh, behind the firewall version of the UX. Is, is, is a, that what you mean by the offline mode? That's the offline mode. So you'd be, you, you wouldn't be required to, to be in a place where you had access to the uh, SAS to, to, to run the UX. Right now, it'll, I think it'll work partially, but we're not, we're not certifying or, or providing any support for a disconnected mode for the UX right now, but that's, that's right. coming. Right, right. So that, and I, and I also think one of the, the token things that uh, I don't believe is in yet, but is, is on the short list is automatically extending the SAS tokens so that you stay logged in uh, if, you're, if your browser's on. That's not our, it's, yeah. it's doing that now, isn't it? Don't or maybe. Think, I don't think so. My session actually survived overnight from last night. I was like, woohoo. Then, hey, then, then Isaac might have fixed it, and I just didn't, didn't realize that. I fixed it also made it in. Okay. Or, or the lifetime of the session sitting there was shorter yeah, than the. If you token. leave the. Um, session open it'll renew the token but it won't leave one that saves overnight if you close it oh okay i see what you mean well, for, both, for both tokens isaac uh no it should not do it for both tokens unless you have two sessions open no i mean no so the endpoint tokens i know you fixed the sas tokens the cognito token I don't, those I don't... are completely amazon yeah they so could have... set the cookies to expire but no, there's a th those are those are short term tokens. I'll I'll work with you on it. I know what to do. I just we need to sit down and do it. But the, okay. since, certain, since certain features of the UX are deactivated if your tokens if your tokens expire um, or appear to expire, um, then we need we need to renew tokens. Shame. What probably happened is it probably the, the cookies are still there. If you refresh, you lose those those pages. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and then there's also a, a bug where um, certain parts of the UX don't show that you were locked, that, that you have access, even though you do. Um, and so there's a couple of places where we've had to, we've told people to refresh. This happened over break. Somebody wanted to create a workflow and they, they could have created the workflow. They just had to hit refresh, but the screen told them they couldn't incorrectly. So the, those are some of the, just the, the things we're going through and trying to fix. Okay. Um, awesome. So let's um, wrap up on the UI UX tweaks. Got a lot of interesting stuff happening there. Got a lot of bugs sort of burned down. Uh, some interesting changes coming and going forward. Some fixes to token handling and uh, panels not closing correctly, which is really nice to get those cleared up. Those are sort of nagging, annoying issues and happy to have those cleared up. Uh, uh, Victor, I saw you, you and Greg uh, talking a little bit about change stage map fix. We had a little bit of an issue with the hanging stage map. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so when I was doing the unit testing for the uh, logging, um, I noticed that uh, if we just flat out did not have a change stage map defined anywhere, um, that the unit tests that uh, I was using to exercise the, um, the uh, task system were failing. And so I just, um, as part of the logging changes, I added a um, Thing that just basically says don't die if you can't find the change stage map parameter just treat it as if it was empty and continue on with life and that winds up doing the right thing anyways so okay and so that's been addressed and hopefully if somebody doesn't have a or has a setup without any change stage map defined then they shouldn't run into any potential issues with a hanging there um it's an issue with, uh, I did some other code restructuring while doing the logging patch um, in order to make it easier to thread the logs through everything. And that was actually a fallout of uh, getting params is slightly stricter with the new code than it was with the old code. So, it's not something that I don't think would uh, affect anyone that hasn't pulled this patch yet. And with its fix in the patch that it won't fix, it won't affect anyone who does pull it in either. Okay, cool. And then I don't think we've had any um, updates on package repository changes. Did we have any outstanding work that was going to happen there? Uh, package repository, no. Well, what do you mean? <laughs> do you mean the was, content? Um, this is with the uh, packet, the, the package repositories attributes related stuff. Yes. Uh, that's in tip now. Yeah, that's, that's, that, that's all in tip now. And that is, it needs to be documented because I, instead of doing documenting that, I went off and, you know, chased the uh, logging uh, rabbit for okay. the holidays. But. Um, should be out in the next uh, major release. I believe it was in 3.5. It's just, it's not documented. So, you know, good luck right. figuring out how to use it. Oh, so it's it's hit stable then in three five. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's available. So but we need I remember to I had a note here that to talk about it because it wasn't quite finished, and it, I guess it's just the documentation. Yes. Okie dokie. All right, so uh, we've got two items left. Uh, we've got some release planning and some um, bug burn down stuff here. Um, we have been remiss, I have been remiss, I should say, in keeping up our DRP version planning uh, panel. We've been moving pretty fast and pushing releases out the door quickly, um, but let's go ahead and address, uh, do we just wanna go straight to uh, issues and close out some tickets here, Rob? You had some thoughts on what you wanted to do here. Uh, yeah, if people have other topics, we can do that first, but... Um... Well, the only other items we have on schedule for today is community feedback and uh, planning and bug burn down. So, so Chris, you got any items to talk about? Uh, he's on chat, which I don't know what the heck I did in my chat window. <laughs> he says no. Nah. 
Uh, good gracious. I don't know where it is. Somebody tell me if he says something. Will do. All right, um, so we'll leave that as is for now, and let's just go ahead and go into to oh. the burn down. Go ahead. Yeah, the, um, yeah, I don't. I, you guys talked about this on this on the week I wasn't wasn't in about auto updates and all the all the tables should have auto update now and not all of the form pages. You just uh, machine and profile have have automatic updates. Uh, just machines and profiles. Okay. Just machine. You're right. It's I, we could we could generalize generalize the pattern and probably put it on most pages. Um, but most of those, most pages don't need it, so we haven't been as, as eager to, to do it. But every, every list does have it. Um, and then the UX also will tell you if you're on a list that, so the first thing, the first thing we added was objects that are in the list auto update. And then um, now, if you if an object is deleted from a list, it'll tell you that it's deleted and tell and highlight the refresh button. And if an item is added, we can't easily add it to the list for you uh, for pagination reasons and some some referential reasons. But the refresh button will turn green, tell you that you need a refresh. So if that, if that refresh button changes color, it's, it's advising you that your, your system's out of date. Your UX is stale. Um, is that um, just a refresh within the panel or you need the entire UX shift reload? Just the panel. Okay. So that's any, any, any time you're doing a forced refresh of the UX, that's really, a, you're, you're hiding a bug. So. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, okay. Awesome. Okay. So you had a. You have an order to go through these. I don't know what order they show. Up, they show up. In. Nope. I I don't. Um. Looks like it's reverse numerical by default. Oh, you're right. It it sure is. Uh, do you want to start with newest or oldest, Ben? Uh, we should probably go to oldest. Let's clean out some of the oldest because I thought, uh, so let's see. Uh, so UI machines, template errors do not render. Yes, uh, let me pull up the cross-referencing. <laughs> We've got all kinds of milestones and whatnot here. Yeah, I, I believe that's fixed. Um, but. Uh, April 4th. Oh, wow. This is before I existed at Bracken. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is going to be this is going to be based on uh, V2 then. No, you got 3.0 no, tag stuff in here. No, there's no there's no 2x stuff. It's all 3.0. Um, okay. But I, I think this is this is closed. Um, I think this is actually the old UX. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty darn certain this is this either this is this should be marked as closed or um, reopened if found. If you mind. All right. So then we've got um, unit tests for token authorization authentication. Oops, sorry. So did you, who's closing, who's closing them behind the scenes? Are you? Uh, I was closing them. You want to close them? You, no, you, no, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Just to make sure that it was, we, we knew who's, who, who had the responsibility. Uh, add unit tests for tokens. Greg, I think we are now testing this. This came in like the 3.3 release. Unit tests for token authorization. Nope. No, we're not testing it. Okay. Not directly. So there's a little bit there, but there's not not what I'm in. Okay. So okay. Leave, that, leave that open. Is yep. it open? Okay. So we're going to leave add bait. Oh. Um, open that one. 
unit test for basic auth, probably the same status, right? So. Front end testing using fake to tokens. Uh, that I think we actually do know. But I'll take it as an item to go update the comments on these two. Okay, so I will sign it to Greg. Oops, And update Sledgehammer to choose machine specific file first. Currently, Discovery Sledgehammer boot and share the startup shell scripts. File is never rendered with a machine. Generic token function. We got a six. Fixed. Uh, can you fix Greg? it? Sledgehammer get the machine specific. Yeah, I'm reading it. Uh, I'll have to look. That may actually work correctly. I don't know off the top of my head. The the git may always be required, so that part's not true. But in the swivel swizzle of some of the boot environment stuff, we've made startup more modular. And so the part that I was worried about may be in a control.sh now template that gets pulled in per machine so it's a little cleaner now than it was before so it may be okay I, I suspect if you'd written this as a use as a use case instead of such a specific feature we can then use case so, uh, so i'll leave that with you to validate then let's let's close and it close. Can. just close it let okay. It, let, wait a second, Greg's thinking. Too late. Closed. I clicked on the close. All right. <laughs> right. The goal. The goal here was. What was the goal? Uh, so that you don't have to generate multiple tokens in the templates. But um, I'll look at it. I mean, it's been sitting for a while, so it's probably okay. Now. So, what's the upshot of this? Restrict auto generated tokens for machine ops? Oh, that one we need to leave open. It's a real issue. We haven't done anything on it, I'm certain. So, if you, it's the intent is to limit the machine tokens to come from certain IPs to increase the security around those tokens. Mm. So that that way the auto-generated token can only be valid if it comes from the IP address of the machine question. Right. So security enhancement. Right, so that way if somebody were snooping or did a curl to get the token in a file, because those are kind of open to some degree, um, the, this would limit your use of being able to generate that from a machine that had the IP of the machine itself. Okay, I just made a few comments there. And then uh, we have boot M preview as an enhancement, an API or CLI call that will return the templates of a boot M rendered as a preview. Ah, yes, this is. String. I don't think we've done anything with this, have we, Greg? Correct. Uh, mm, nope. Well, mm, uh, no, we have not. This is uh, give me an API call that will render the boot in as a machine. Yes. Uh, which would essentially simulate a machine um, having its templates rendered when it's. Um, Provision. It's like a dry run. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's, yeah. And the same with okay. template preview, the next one. We haven't implemented those. Um, I think that they still be useful. Yeah. There's a question of use, but I don't know. Uh, 
Yeah, there's some weird contextual things around that, but so we should target. I'm, I'm going to at least switch these to target the future release as a as the target since we're not committing. Yeah, the, I mean. It's nothing that I'd commit resource to resources to right now. Okay. I'm yeah, going, I'm, I, switching, I'm switching it to the future release milestone instead of release. Will was suggesting these before he realized you could curl them. Oh. Well, but you can system. you can only curl them after a machine has enduring a machine's provisioning process, yeah, but, right? But well, yeah, kind of. But if you have a machine sitting in sledgehammer, you can actually force it into the boot environment without actually doing anything. And then you can curl them, right? So there's ways around it, but yeah, there's, it's, it is an obvious feature request to make life simpler for debugging and developing boot environments and templates, right? That makes sense. It's just right now, is that the highest priority item that we should be working on? Yeah, I don't know. It's actually a nice low hanging fruit for the future. Oops, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch some of these uh, yep. bugs to I'm just I'm cleaning up the milestones in the background chain, so don't 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 mess with the milestones. Okay, no. <laughs> that was loud. Sorry, I was across the room. <laughs> All right, so these two are tied together. I'll leave these. Um, Rob's going to hit the milestones on those. Uh, we have explode ISO fails with SE Linux enabled. I believe this was fixed um, within isolated install mode, and that was because it was TFTP or TFTP boot versus TFTP roots was set incorrectly in the install.shell script, and that was fixed. I believe that is correct. And do we know what release it was fixed in? Does it matter? It was, yeah, it was, it was fixed in 3.1, I believe. I fixed it um, before we cut 3.1. Uh, I believe it was 3.1. It was definitely in 3.2 for sure. But yeah, that's been a while. Okay. Uh, yep. So yeah, we're not. We haven't been using the milestones, so they're not. They don't show up. Anyway, okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and comment and close. That's cool. Let me see if I can get the milestones for the other releases in here. All right. So add unit test for ensure that a modified template renders. No description. Greg. Sorry. Hold on. Uh, Holding on. You have to add it in a separate location. Uh, do I? Uh, yeah, just a second. Sorry. We're, we're trying to cr put the milestones in so that we can assign them correctly in the background. Hey, wait, that's better. Yeah, it's uh, not too early. At least it's true. Uh, which one is this, Jay? Add unit test for ensure that a modified template renders, number 255. Okay. Oh, uh, that happened already. You know when? Quite a while ago. Yeah. Probably sometime in May. From pre 3.1 then. So in uh, 3 x somewhere. Yeah, it came about as probably a side effect of some of the unit test updates for the August, September work I was doing with stages. Okay, I'm going to comment and close and just say it was completed somewhere in 3.0x. Yeah. Uh, add unit test to ensure a modified inline template in a boot end renders. 256. They're related. Um, yep. they, they, their, their paths got merged. All right, uh, and then switch props to be more key saver-ish. Uh, 
Is that better than key flavorish? Well, <clears throat> we have not done this. Uh, yeah. This is a. Is, this, is it still applicable? It is. But I think, given how we're using preferences now, it's less of a concern. Yeah, effectively, there's a there's a there's a there's an exact number of preferences and. We exposed them all. Yeah, the my concern, and it's still there to some degree, is that the preferences um, are feel like key value information that are low level configuration options. But what we've chosen to do instead of just making it a general key value store is that we actually drive it as a node space with everything fully enumerated all the time. And we validate it as such. So um, I'm okay leaving it that way for now. And so that's probably fine. Uh, and at the time I wrote this, I was concerned that we were gonna have pref explosion, but we haven't really. Okay, so what do we want to do with this? We want to leave it as a placeholder or we want to close it and reopen it when it's I, an issue in the future or? I would close it and we'll reopen it if uh, prefs explode here in the future. Because right now I don't expect them to explode. Explode. I got all the milestones in and three, six and future are the only active ones. Sweet. Okay. So I'm closed with comment on that, uh, switch prefs and then uh, template was stored in backend as invalid JSON. I'm guessing that had to have been fixed. Uh, have, new lines were expanded. I, I have not seen that since then. Yeah. Yeah, that could go away. Plus, the whole back is different now, so it's a three-one fixed. Kind of. Yeah. Now that we have the unified store, it doesn't. We don't go through that path anyway. All right. So I'm gonna close and comment now. Cool. And then um, template stored. So back to page one. Document local repo template library option. Okay. Do so, better. Greg, do better. Yeah. So this goes away. <laughs> Strangely enough. Well, I think it went away in, in Victor's rework of the template repo or the repo repository options. So that's a three. Yeah, basically the fact that we have stackable content makes this gone. Well, this and in conjunction with your uh, repository parameter that lets you yeah. kind of specify local in a completely more better way, more better way, better way, whatever. The, the need for documentation of the other things still exists, but that doesn't need to be documented anymore. All right, then we've got uh, something more general. Yeah. Add contain string function to indexer. Yeah, do that. Name equals contains freds. That's been done? No, 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 it needs to be done. Oh. It'd be pretty cool if it was. Yeah, it'd be awesome, but it doesn't today. We need uh, a general we target three six or further, future. Uh Future, seeing as three six is the end of this week, right? Yeah. Yeah, and implementing right. this thing so, is uh, 
I'm going to add a 3.7 Trickier in there. than you might think. Yeah, and contains actually needs to handle both for string and list, but that's a different, you know. Yeah, that's, that's what makes implementing this trickier than you might otherwise think. Yeah. Uh, but it, doc it, it, API. It's really useful. Address cannot be processed. Tip swagger JSON and visual rebar. Uh, that's resolved. Say that again. That was resolved, I believe. Which one? Uh, sorry, 380. 380 is resolved. It was a transient error that one of our interns had while building the docs while a build was running. You can mark it as a bug or it's invalid. Just close and comment. Um, reservations should not always use two hours for lease. So I think this is been corrected. I think, Greg, you fixed this to make this configurable? Yes, this has been resolved, I believe. Let me... so I'll leave that open while you check. Um, clean up exploded ISOs. This has not been done. Um, and it's been backlogged for a while. Um, I'm, yeah, this would be a, an API would be good for this. Mm -hmm. Although, yeah, it, it could get kind of tricky. Oh, what you want to delete and whether it's used or not, or. Yeah, that's the is fun this, part. Is this, is this as, as necessary now that we can do a redirect on ISOs or on? environments well so the the issue is if it's been exploded out in your local tftp route it's eating space and you may no longer need it but um it's still sitting there and you have to manually currently go into uh your tftp boot directory and go oh sledgehammer you know i've got six versions of sledgehammer now and i only need the most current one so delete the previous five but I have CentOS 7.3, now I have CentOS 7.4, um, ISO that's been exploded out. Right. And I'm no longer referring to 7.3, I want to delete 7.3. I mean, a lot of that sort of manual knowledge, tribal knowledge about what you are and aren't using, but some of it is directly re related to whether or not you've provisioned against it or intend to provision against it in the future. No, that makes sense. Is, should we have uh, additional labels besides just enhancement? Oh, uh, this is just an enhan enhancement label. Yeah, I know, I know. For other things that are higher urgency. Oh, so um, so we'd have something like uh, priority. Yeah. Actually, yeah. No. Yeah, let's not worry about it. All right. Um, I'm going to leave I'll it. Add, just I'll, add a, I'll add a, a, pri a priority label. 414 still exists. All right, um, we've only got uh, about uh, 10 minutes here before we need to wrap up and we've got a fair bit to go through. So let's hammer through these. Uh, Greg, did you determine reservations should not always use to our lease? It is not fixed. Say it again. It is not fixed. <gasps> it's not. Oh, no joke. I actually added a comment what line needs to be fixed. All right, and uh, okay then. We have a uh, Victor Lowther opened a ticket. Add example API endpoints number four thirty eight. Endpoint should return a common YAML representation of the model in question to use as easy to use templates and operator documentation. Actually, I think you added this because I suggested it. And it has gone precisely nowhere since then. Yeah. Oh, great all the content packages. 
And oops, this did not get closed. Uh, enable local file server. Yeah, that was a major point. Yeah, you did this, Greg. Completed yeah. in three four. Yeah, I think it's three four. Uh, Rob, are you going to add the? I guess we don't add a milestone. We're just close. Close and comment. Okay. It's handy too. Which one was it? Um, 447. Oh, whoops. All right. This is why I didn't see it. Uh, UX deleting a boot env or template fails without error when referenced elsewhere. Try to delete boot env and template in 3.1. I think this was fixed, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I, things, still, things still fail silently. Um, what, what I would suggest, so I, I think that there's a class of UX bugs that we should solve by just exposing events to you. Oh, actually, you can hear it now. Oh, really? Get the, oh, get oh well, then if it was fixed in the back end, then the UX, should, UX will expose it when it fails, because UX does that. So it should be fixed. We don't need to test it. Uh, so we mark. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is fixed. I think we still need to test it, but yeah. Now, basically, every every error like this that you get back that uh, should bubble up as a error model that gets returned from the API with the appropriate HTTP status node. So, so this this makes me think though of a. Oh, okay, so the, the error message you get back in the API has a detailed messages section described in the post. And, and the UX has default behavior that shows that to you. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, so that should be good. The question becomes, if you get an error back, should, like with the new logging stuff, we could actually pop up a little screen that says, we, we detected an error. You, you, you know, we, we logged back an error, here it is. Oh, well, the point is the API gave you there's it no, gives it to you. Yeah. yeah, there's no error, right? There's, the logging would be for errors. There's no error there. You ask us to do an action. You know, said that action is not allowed. That's not an error per se. That's information that we send back to the API call explaining why it failed. Right? And that just needs to be explained. And if that's correctly being returned, then you have issues. So I think this is closed. If it was a back, it was a back end. Oh, it was actually an eight uh, API bug. So you want me to close this then? Um, I think we should mark it. Yeah, close and verify. Uh, I don't think I get that option. Oh. In this setup. So I think you can close. Yeah, it. I think we need to leave it open and verify that it's. That the AP that the uh, UX is doing the right thing. Uh, all right, I can add a flag for a, a label for verify. How's that? That's okay, so I'm just going to comment for now, and I'll let you add the flag to it. Um, The clone function uh, isn't, isn't done the way that one says. The colorized content display is not done. Uh, no. The embedded assets override is done. Where are you at? I'm just flying through these real quick. OK. Uh, I like, I like why is it telling me the number? Uh, so, uh, Add clone function to read only pop up panels has not been yeah, done. The colorized there. content pre print not done. The embedded asset override is. You can, That's there's now a directory done. that if you put the override files in, they'll be used instead. How is that implemented so you can add the reference to the directory? The param of some sort? It's a default directory that you can override on DRP startup and on a it, flag, startup it, flag. 
Yeah, but the point is if the, the directory of exists, and so if you uh, put content in there and restart DRP, it'll use that content instead of the embedded content. Resizable content window, I don't think was that one. We fixed the sizing of it. Yeah, but making a resizable one is a different. Yeah, right. Uh, we don't have an updated plugin model yet. Uh, That's a, that is probably is a should we throw it in three seven or is it going to be longer? Uh, probably longer unless we just clear we're going to do it. Default stage transition. Yes, that's done. Uh, dang it. Yes, that's done. That was a 3.5. Okay, I, tried, I tagged it. Okay. Oh, I should call it close. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we're not doing that yet. Uh, archive compression handling internally via Golang, not external packages is not done. Yeah. There's some investigation, but I move that to future. Uh, we're logging in. Uh, yeah. This upgrade is all four content packages. Uh, wait, after logging into the portal, locked icons still remain. Yeah, that's still there. Uh, uh, is it? All right, Isaac has it. Uh, that's, that's on Isaac's list. Let me, give, right. let me assign it to him. See? Um, and but you're logged in. Okay. Uh, and then uh, upgrade all for content packages. So if there's multiple contents. Yeah, that seems like uh, a good one. I don't think it's there. We got a step okay. closer with the new. Um, oh, yeah. So we're, we're closer to that. So there's significant there's progress because now it yeah. tells you which things are out of date. And we can debate whether we actually want upgrade all as a option. I, we, we might we might still want to have people yeah. make choices. Well, that's why an upgrade all button is a choice. They can pick or not, as opposed to individually selecting packages and upgrading the way we currently do. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty standard for any yeah, Android apps. It's, it's, a, it's, it's reasonable and we actually have the data so we can send people to do it. Yeah, it's not a burning issue though. So uh, enhance registered endpoint management. There was a bunch of work done around that actually about two weeks ago, I think two or three weeks ago. Yeah, no, it's for some reason it, it's, there's a bug where it's not working right. So leave it open. Okay, um, the how to run DR provision with existing DACP server. That's the whole proxy stuff. It's been resolved, but I was hoping that this guy would come back and test it. But I don't think he's tested it. So I'll put verify as a label. Yep. Uh, we've actually verified it through um, a few other community members using that feature now. Yeah, agreed. I agree it works, but I want him to test it in his environment, ideally. Yeah, I hear you. But, but he hasn't come back to us. Yeah, so it's OK. I mean, yeah. OK, so. Um, so just close it. He hasn't come back for a month, so it's OK. Just close it. OK, I'll close it. I'm making a note when it's like. <coughs> oh. Oops, and we're over time. Yeah. 552 is done. 558 is done. Uh, 599 is fixed. Removing stages results in profile error. I think. Because so I think we fixed it. Yeah, we fixed the underlying profile error problem. Yeah. I think all the rest of those are made, except for the one Rob's opening. Oh, and five, five forty two can close as well.
Which is the great common package repo. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be fixed in 360, right? No, that was fixed in 350. Yep. And did we want a machine naming? This is actually not a bug. Which one? Machine name beginning with number of breaks provisioning. It does, actually. Okay. Yes, it does. And it cost me all our... kinds of grief because I named my five minute demo machine uh, five minute dash demo and I couldn't understand why it suddenly broke. So um, yeah, uh, that is there to deal with um, the fact that we tend to use machine names as DNS names and depending on which uh, DNS server you're talking to, you might get weird results. Yeah, it's not defined as a part of to stupidly interpret anything yes. that begins with a number as an IP address. It's not supposed to, and it hasn't been supposed. It hasn't supposed to been supposed to doing that for like fifteen years. But guess what? Uh, so I'm sorry. The rest of them were not resolved. Not resolved. Okay. Well, we. we Clouds are a good portion of them. So uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. And uh, Spectre, if you want to go ahead and close up, thank you.